Welcome to the Future of Eastern Europe and Eco-Democracy, a four-part podcast special produced by the Green European Foundation with the support of the Green Institute of Greece and the financial support of the European Parliament to the Green European Foundation. The podcast features extracts from interviews of delegates to the Future of Eastern Europe conference, which took place on the 6th and 7th of June in Riga. The conference brought together young green activists from different parts of Eastern Europe to talk about the future of the region, as well as the challenges and opportunities for an ecological and progressive turnaround. In this episode, we hear from Katja Andreeva, member of the Cooperation and Development Network Executive Committee, and representative of Ukraine, Lucina Kosakian, also a member of the CDN Executive Committee and co-founder of Frontline Youth Network in Armenia, Georgi Ptskalaje, network coordinator at CDN and one of the organizers of the conference, and Alexei from the Belarusian Greens. The episode focuses on the current geopolitical situation, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and the wider debate on security and peace. What do you think are the main political reasons behind this war started 80 years ago? For me, it's imperialist ambitions of uh, Russian nature, uh, like Russian empire, as we, I can I call it uh, like this now. So because Ukraine did not attack any country, Ukraine just uh, tried to live their own life. We wanted to become a member of European Union. We want to uh, become a member of NATO, not just to like fight someone, but just to be secure and to feel their safety because it's... Uh, it's very hard now to understand what, okay, if our country were in NATO, nothing will happen to us. And uh, yeah, we just wanted to live our own, own lives. But uh, Putin decided that their uh, sphere of influence should be on Ukraine too. Firstly, I would like to ask you, how have you experienced conflict as a young activist and how did you try to resolve it? I'm coming from Armenia. I've been born and raised in Tavush region, which is basically the bordering province of Tavush and its neighboring with Azerbaijan. I've been born in the year when the 19th war ended. So I never seen the war at that time, but as a child, I experienced the consequences of the war. And from then, I guess peace became one of the driving forces of my activism. After as you know, yeah, during 2020, we experienced our second war. So it was always there when I've been doing my activism. I studied human rights and democracy. I also did my research in, in peace. Now I'm trying to devote my time, my knowledge on the um, grassroots activism and also try to advocate for peace and also peace education. Now, within Frontline's activities, this is what we basically do. We do peace advocacy, peace education, and we're trying to push women's and young people's participation in peace processes. As the first question, I would like to ask you if you could choose a specific moment or historical event that played a crucial role in the current geopolitical situation in Eastern Europe, which event would that be? I think that a uh, key event in uh, this situation, geopolitical situation, is the fall of the Soviet Union, because uh, the fall of the Soviet Union uh, creates a lot of uh, ethnic and uh, economic and so on and so forth problems in this region, but uh, not uh, provides something that fix these problems. So Nagorno-Karabakh problem begins after falling of Soviet Union, and uh, Crimean problems begins after falling of Soviet Union. Union. So when Soviet Union falls, uh, Crimea problem was not solved exactly that Russia will stop in their demands on Ukraine. So how did your country experience the fall of the Soviet Union? After falling of the Soviet Union, we have uh, our parliament that elected in 1990, and it was a uh, semi-democratic parliament because uh, the election of 1990 was um, half uh, fairy, but uh, it have a lot of democratic opposition and uh, it uh, 
accept a lot of uh, important documents in Belarus independence. But after that, uh, the elites in Belarus uh, should uh, try to collect their first capital. And then they shouldn't need the system of uh, Soviet democracy that uh, doing in Belarus after 1990. And they provide new constitution that was a presidential constitution. And after election in 1994, uh, Alexander Lukashenko was elected. So after that, they uh, create institutional Uh, roots for the autocracy in Belarus, and uh, weak parliament can't oppose uh, this uh, establishing of uh, dictatorship in the country. And uh, since 1996, Belarus is a fully autocracy, and till now it's a dictatorship. During the last days, we had an extensive session about the, the Russian invasion in Ukraine. In your opinion, what are the main political reasons behind the current Russian invasion in Ukraine? And which are the best possible solutions? Mm -hmm. That is a very, very hard question. To I think we had a very good good discussion uh, on on context of this invasion by, by our members of the city and executive committee members and former executive committee members from Ukraine. I think that I had a very great input how this happened. But to, to go to what, what I think, I agree with all of, all of the things that has been said from my friends from Ukraine, but I would follow up on this that what we are seeing is Russia is a declining global power. I mean, Russia is not a Soviet Union. Russia is not the second biggest player in the world politics or international order. Russia is third or even fourth and it's going to go worse and worse and worse because, because of this abstract and obscure nationalism and this conservatism and this imperialism that is in the genes of the Russian politics for the last hundreds of years, which has not changed even in the last 30 years. Uh, with its imperial ambitions, we're seeing how they're harming economy, how they're harming their own people, how they're harming their neighbors. So Russia is a declining power. And because Russia is a declining power, I think this it realizes that it's a declining power and it wants to do something to somehow to position itself as a global power again. And to create with China and with other authoritarian countries to create an alternative to the global, let's say, liberal order, which we have to criticize. I mean, during this conference, we have talked a lot about these two sides. And uh, well, I think we are part of this liberal camp, but it doesn't mean that it's perfect. And I think when we will be discussing NATO and the European Union and the USA and all this, the Western camp, this liberal order camp, we have to be very, very, very critical of it, but we should be also aware that we are part of this camp. And sadly, I don't see any other camps in this, in this role. So what Russia is trying to do is to have this create this alternative to this liberal order. And alternative is very conservative, almost fascist we can say what what putin's speech was before the invasion of ukraine this was this was the fascism and this is uh, just insane that we heard this in 2022 so one thing is that it wants to stay relevant uh, and the other one it it wants to control the region. Russia, is, as an imperial power, sees the Eastern Europe as its own sphere of influence. So for it, Ukraine especially, and Ukraine and Belarus, because, you know, there is this myth that it's the uh, same nation and this brotherhood and or sisterhood or whatever, this mythology, which is very much shaped from a Russian side. And Russia is a big brother. For Russia, Ukraine that doesn't want to be in Russia is a almost an existential threat, especially for the non-democratic and authoritarian Russia, because if Ukraine, and it will, manages to be democratic, be part of this, let's say, liberal camp, but also have the possibility to pursue more social, more ecological policies and be prosperous, Well, that's a danger for Russia because, well, people in Russia are not living well. Russia is very... Inequality is, is one of the highest in this world. You have these two cities which are in which city centers, people live good, few of them. And then you have Russia where 20% of the population doesn't have access to water, doesn't have access to gas in Russia, which is in exporting gas and gas is like 40% of their economy almost. They don't have electricity and the gas and 
It is very poor in, in that sense. So of course it is dangerous if they will see Ukraine as, a, as an example. It's a threat to, to Putin and to... And it's not just Putin. I mean, if there was no Putin, there would be some Vladimir Ivanovich Ivanov, right? It's not Putin. It's, it's a system which enables Putin. And this is also super important to never forget when we say that about this war, this is not only Putin's war, this is the systemic war. So and on the one hand, we have this conservative, like 19th century, stuck in 19th century Russia, and um, which wants to destroy this order. And on the other hand, we have Ukraine, which wants to be democratic, which wants to be more European, which wants to be more social. This is behind this. Because, I mean, Russia doesn't want territories, right? I mean, it's very large. It doesn't want Crimea because it wants Crimea. I mean, okay, Crimea, it, it wants for a number of other regions like Black Sea and everything. It, it will lead us to a different discussion. But it's not only about the territories. It's like its second thing. It, it is about not allowing Ukraine to become, to be a country as an example for Russian citizens. And I think that is one of the big parts which we should always take into consideration. It is evident that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has brought up to the surface a series of fundamental existential questions both for Greens and members of the Green political movement more widely, environmental activists as well, and advocates of peace and demilitarization. There are a series of very difficult questions that need to be answered, everything from security to energy and autonomy, as well as fundamental issues with regards to authoritarianism and democracy. How do we respond to these challenges? How do we respond to an aggressive neo-imperialist power? How do we respond to increasing militarization of our own societies and increased military spending? What is the role that Europe has to play as a geopolitical actor now and in the future as a guarantor of peace and security in Eastern Europe? How can cooperation between different countries in Eastern Europe develop a different kind of security architecture for the whole of the region? Are we back in the era of spheres of influence or can we envisage a new and better reality for everyone involved? You actually held a really interesting workshop uh, this day where you mentioned positive and negative conflict. I was wondering whether you could briefly explain the differentiation between the two. And I would also like to ask you, do you think that in Eastern Europe right now we are experiencing more positive or negative conflict? And uh, what is uh, the influence of that uh, to like the war with Ukraine? Sure. Peace is really abstract phenomenon and it is really hard to understand sometimes what is peace. But uh, theoretically, there are two dimensions, two definitions of peace. One is negative and the other one is positive peace. So when it comes to negative peace, it is rendered as situation when there is no violence, no conflict. So this is negative peace. But when we talk about peace in general, I guess we every individual will refer to positive peace, which is more than absence of violence, but also the environment where people can function and anything that will guarantee security and safety of each individual. Well, when all of these are there, we can then call it as a positive peace. For Europe, well, Europe itself is not unilateral, right? It has different development dynamics within its states. So we have several states that proudly would say that they were living their lives in peace. So their peace could be basically more Western Europe, could be rendered as positive peace. But simultaneously, we have Eastern Europe when at the moment currently we see Ukraine in war. So this is the absence of war. But as I mentioned, in 2020, the situation in Belarus, the violent actions and also the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan and nowadays situation, this is basically can be called absence of peace. 
and revealed as negative piece, basically, absence of war. So there is no single answer to this, but Europe has different faces at this point, and you can find both positive and negative peace situations. So if you mention NATO, I will grab the chance to ask you, according to you, can the NATO play the role of security warrant or in Eastern mm-hmm. Europe? That is a very Super hard question because, I mean, I'm coming from the Greens and I'm part of the Green political family. And the Green political family was founded as a political group which was, well, against the NATO back in the 80s. We were against the NATO, we were against the military bases, we were pacifists, we were against um, delivering arms and so on and so forth. But I think this is, we are living in a very different time now. I mean, there has been some red signs and warnings um, that things have not been going well and Russia is a threat to us. Well, the war in Georgia, the starting of the war in Ukraine 2014, I mean, in the 90s, Chechnya, which people I mean, just forget what Russia did and it, they did terrible things. They, it was almost a genocide of the people of Chechnya. So uh, there was these red flags already there, but somehow Western Europe did ignore it and we should credit it. But for the NATO side, it is very hard. Well, if we want to be relevant politically and if we want to be sane, we have to adjust our positions. We cannot always be perfectly fit into the ideological desires that we are having of the world peace and the world without arms and all this. All these beautiful things which I want to see in this world. I don't want to see any arm in the world and I don't, I don't want to live in a world without nuclear weapons and without any rockets and any missiles and tanks and great. But to do the reality check, we have a threat which is imminent threat. It's not like China. I mean, China is a threat as well for us. But Russia is a very imminent threat, which started war in Ukraine, and it can start possibly war in the country that is part of the NATO. I mean, of course, it's, it is unlikely because, I mean, Russia is kind of losing the war in Ukraine, but can you imagine Russia fighting a NATO? Of course not. NATO can destroy Russia in a second. It's not equal powers. I mean, Russia is not Soviet Union again. It's much more weak. So, but Russia can do a lot of bad things still. I mean, it can beat people and, and it can cause destruction. And I mean, well, and I very much hope we are not living through this, but if, well, it's going to be the end of the world if Russia decides to attack a NATO country, right? But I mean, I think NATO is stopping Russia from attacking the NATO countries because it knows very well if it does, I mean, it's the end of the world. So I do think that the NATO is a guarantee of security in Eastern Europe. Of course, it's, it, it is to be taken with a pinch of salt. And we should be openly criticizing some actions of the NATO and or the way it works. Or like we have the past, not the best things the NATO has done. But coming from this, I'm coming from Georgia. If Georgia was, if NATO member states gave Georgia membership back in, or not just the membership, but the membership action plan back in 2008 to Georgia and Ukraine, instead of writing this very, very vague and very non-specific phrase that Georgia and Ukraine will become members of the NATO, it is written there. But I mean, it's not written when, how, what conditions. If West was more pragmatic back then and did not block the membership of the Georgia and Ukraine, I'm very confident that what we are seeing now would not happen. And it it is the responsibility of the Western leaders what is happening in Ukraine, and we should address that. Because if you look at the other countries, Baltic states, we are now in Riga. Baltic states has a big problem of, ethnically, there are a lot of Russians living in these countries. And one of the reasons why how Russia started the war, how it justifies the war from its own perspective, is is that it it has its, this term, I forgot in English, co-citizen or something like that, you know. And... It believes that everyone who is ethnical Russian and is kind of Russian speaking is can be conceived perceived as a citizen of Russia. So it gives itself a right to invade another country if they're ethnical Russians who are under danger. Baltic states, there's a almost dozen, several dozen percentage of the population are ethnical Russians. So it is a perfect casus belli for Russia to invade. And I think If there was no NATO in the Baltic states, we would have seen this happening, what is happening in Ukraine here, even much earlier. Based on these examples that we already have, 
I think we can clearly say that yes, NATO is a security guarantee for Eastern Europe and would be good to, you know, in the future have some kind of alternative of the NATO and think about that in the future. But for now, I mean, NATO is a security guarantee for Eastern Europe, but not only for the Eastern Europe. I mean, if you see Russian tanks, what is written there, and if you see Russian helicopter, which Ukrainians took down on the uh, on Ukrainian soil from the air, it says Na Berlin, which is on Berlin. So, I mean, Kiev is not only city that is in danger. Berlin is in danger, Paris is in danger, Brussels is in danger, Washington is in danger. So we have to understand that we are living in a very different world starting from the February, and then we have to adjust our political positions based on the reality that we are living in. Do you think that NATO can act as the safety guarantor for the EU? Or should, at least? I can uh, NATO in a way, uh, like, uh, use uh, their military forces on the territory of Ukraine? Or? In general, like, mm-hmm. if you think that NATO is there to provide security for European countries. Is that his role? Is that its role or is it something else? For me, yes, especially for countries who are near the near this Russia, like a Baltic countries, for example, they also can be in a danger now. And yeah, even like uh, not not how a military movie actor. But mostly as a like a diplomacy actor, like a political actor, they know that country who was in this union, they are somehow in cooperation, and they somehow train their soldiers. For example, they prepare their army not to like have a big war, just to act immediately and to, and to know how to act. Because, for example, then the star war started eight years ago. Ukraine have a very has a very big army, and that's why uh, Russia occupied our territory so fast. Now you could possibly run us through your presentation, the parts we haven't mentioned so far. So for today. We even cannot count how many people died, how many civilians and Ukrainian soldiers died uh, during these full-scale invasions. We just know that it's not 100 people, it is not 1,000 people, it is uh, 10,000 of people, unfortunately, and 10,000 of families uh, lose their family members, lose their friends, and it's a, such a tragedy for Ukrainian now. And... Uh, Every six uh, Ukrainian became a uh, refugee, and they not only went abroad, they also travel across the Ukrainian in, uh, and they try to find the safest place. But uh, Russia attacked every city, and for example, in Lviv, where I live now, as a uh, internal displaced person too, because my city was occupied. We had uh, air raids, uh, Syrians, uh, like we can have at any time. And uh, for example, a week ago, the Russia bombing Lviv uh, today is uh, two evenings. And when you just sit in your corridor or you just sit in the basement and wait in when it finished. And for today, also, we know that uh, more than 30,000 of uh, Russian soldiers were died. And it means that it's not Putin's war, it's a war of these soldiers who died. It's also where families, it's also where friends who support, I think, their decision to to went to Ukraine and to fight and to not like, return home. What do you think the peace landscape in Europe is going to be in 10 years from now? I wish I were more hopeful on that. I wish there could be, of course, there would be, of course, positive peace everywhere. But nowadays, dynamics of power and also dependence of states to each other. Yeah, I guess that we won't see positive peace in all European state in 10 years, but I wish we act for peace and at least see the negative peace there so we can also build on that. You've been listening to part one of the future of Eastern Europe and eco-democracy. 
a podcast special made possible by the Green European Foundation and the Green Institute of Greece. <laughs>